One of the biggest mysteries today is, where is everyone? The Fermi Paradox. Why is it that we're not actually hearing any aliens communicating across the galaxy? And one of the major ways we've been trying to answer this question is by continuously trying to listen to the universe, trying to discover some signal somewhere out there that might actually show us that we're not alone and that there are actually other species living somewhere out there far, far away. But so far, nothing. No signals, no communication, no one is talking to us. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the idea of radio signals, radio signals that we send from Earth and that someone out there could actually be listening to or one day intercept sometime in the future. We're going to discuss the idea of what potential exoplanets that are close to us may have already intercepted some of our signals and might have also discovered the planet Earth orbiting around the Sun. And more specifically, are there any planets, habitable planets out there that might have already heard our signals and might have also had a chance to discover planet Earth orbiting around the Sun? Which is essentially how we look for exoplanets and how we try to find some sort of an intelligence out there. Which is pretty much exactly what this study tried to do by using some of the observations from the Gaia telescope and combining them with the idea of radio transmissions for the past hundred something years. But let's start with a bit of a history. Or actually, I guess a question to you. Do you happen to know when the first radio transmission happened on the planet? More specifically, who actually started it? Who was the inventor of radio transmission? Now, for some reason, a lot of you might actually think that it was Tesla simply because of the, well, what I usually refer to as availability heuristic. Because Tesla is known as the father of a lot of different transmissions. But that is actually really, really far from the truth. Tesla had nothing to do with radio transmissions or the idea of radio communications. The father of radio transmissions is actually this person right here, Guglielmo Marconi. Totally mispronounced it. My apologies to all my Italian viewers. In early 20th century, he was actually pretty famous, he even won the Nobel Prize, but I think today, most people have completely forgot about him. Even though he pretty much single-handedly began the era of radio transmissions and radio communication. Now, interestingly, a lot of the 19th century physicists generally did not believe radio communications were possible. Mostly because they thought that the light could only travel in a straight line, so anything in the path of the light, such as for example, let's just say a mountain or a tree, would completely disrupt communication, making it impossible. For this reason, up until late 1800s, or essentially 1890, the vast majority of early scientists believed that it was impossible to communicate using radio waves or using any kind of a light at all. Only communication through cable was believed to be possible. Which is of course why the telegraph became the most prominent way of communication for the first uh, few decades. But Marconi did not think so, and he decided to prove everyone wrong by trying to do this over and over by building various antenna. In 1894 he was able to transmit uh, first signals over a distance of just under a mile, and then he had a major breakthrough when he changed the shape of the antenna, lifted it a little bit higher, and also grounded the transmitter and the receiver allowing him to transmit for almost 3 kilometers in distance. Something that up until that point was thought to be impossible. And so a lot of his early experimentation eventually led to what's known as the Marconi's Law. The relationship between the length of the antenna and the maximum distance that you're able to achieve by transmitting a signal. And within only a few years he was able to successfully transmit signals farther and farther away, eventually demonstrating the ability to the British government. And well, the rest is history. The radio was created and the radio transmission has begun. But naturally, all of these transmissions didn't just stay on Earth. A lot of them also escaped into the outer space. And some of the more powerful historical transmissions might even be detected by someone somewhere out there sometime in the future. But generally though, because of the so-called inverse square law of propagation, pretty much most of the radio broadcasts from planet Earth would actually become nothing but radio noise by the time it reaches a distant planet somewhere out there. Now obviously not all of the signals, but definitely the vast majority. Nevertheless, because the radio transmission has been going on for around 127 years now, as of the date of this video, a group of wonderful people whose website you can find in the description below created this really cool website that shows us how far various hit songs traveled across the galaxy and what stars they might have reached already in the last 111 or so years. Now, first of all, human transmission in general has actually not gone that far. That white pixel you see right there, that's basically how much we've covered so far. You can sort of see it slightly better in this map made by the Planetary Society that shows this tiny, tiny pixel 
which represents about 100 years of radio communication, which sort of shows you, first of all, how small we are, but also shows you how little we've achieved in the last 100 years or so. Our advanced civilization has only really been on this planet for an extremely short time. Nevertheless, though, this website is really cool. Here you can travel away from planet Earth, and as you move away from planet Earth, hear some of the hit songs that were playing at that particular time. So, for example, if we were to take a look at one of the more popular stars known as Ross128, well, they're probably hearing Beyonce and single ladies right now. The star that you see right here is roughly around 10.3 light years away from us. Whereas the TRAPPIST-1 system that has a lot of different terrestrial planets orbiting around it is now getting signals from the early 80s and probably hearing some of the songs from that era as well. And so here you can kind of sort of travel in time in terms of the music hits and take a look at how far some of the radio waves from those songs traveled, including of course some of the early hits from the 1900s. But once again, remember, most of these signals are very likely going to be nothing but a background noise. Whoever is possibly trying to listen for these signals would have to have an extremely advanced technology to be able to discern these signals from the background radiation. But here we're going to assume that they have this ability. And so the scientists in this particular paper wanted to actually take a look at First of all, what planets out there, or I guess in some sense what star systems, might have a potential to have some sort of an extraterrestrial intelligence that is able to not just hear these signals, but might be able to establish that there is a planet orbiting around the Sun, and that planet might also be habitable. And so by using the catalog from Gaia telescope that analyzed billions and billions of stars, they were able to find out that since the original transmission about 100 years ago, approximately 75 different stars would have an ability to see planet Earth. And when I say see planet Earth, I mean this. They might be able to see as the planet passes in front of the Sun and thus be able to determine that there is an exoplanet in the habitable zone of this particular star system, which is essentially how we found most of the planets as well. But of all of those 75 star systems that have a potential to see planet Earth, which of them have planets? And more specifically, do any of them have habitable planets that have already been identified in some of the other surveys? Well, as you can probably imagine, the answer is yes. But it turns out that a lot of them we've already discussed in a lot of other videos. The closest of these planets is this star that I've mentioned previously, Ross 128. Ross 128 is one of the most exciting star systems near us because it does have a terrestrial world in the habitable zone of the star system, but the star system itself is a red dwarf. And so we're not entirely sure what conditions it might have on the surface. Nevertheless, this planet known as Ross 128b has always been one of the most exciting potential targets when looking for any signals or signs of extraterrestrial life. And since this particular star system is 13th closest to us, it also makes this a potential target for some of the future missions once we actually figure out how to travel between stars as well. The next system that the scientists discovered is also relatively close to us, the star system known as the Tea Garden Star. And this one has two terrestrial planets with a mass relatively similar to planet Earth, with one of them being in the habitable zone as well. The planet simulated right here known as Tea Garden C. And so once again, this particular star system can actually detect Earth and has obviously already received signals from the planet as well. It's slightly farther away at about 12 light years away from planet Earth, but once again it's also a red dwarf, meaning that we're not entirely sure what conditions these planets have on the surface. Then, at a distance of 40 light years away from us, we have TRAPPIST-1. Yet another red dwarf, but this time with 7 different terrestrial exoplanets. With at least 3 to maybe even 4 in the habitable zone. So this is definitely a really exciting system, and once again a system that seems to be able to see planet Earth as well. But then there is another star system, once again a red dwarf, but this one is not as well known. A star system containing three different exoplanets, with possibly one in the habitable zone as well. This one is sometimes also known as Gliese 83.1. And at a distance of 14.6 light years away from us, it's also relatively close as well. And so of these four star systems, if there is actually anyone living on those exoplanets and is able to listen to radio waves, they should be hearing some of the radio waves coming from planet Earth. But that's a big if, actually an extremely big if. As a matter of fact, nobody is probably hearing anything on those planets. And there are actually many reasons for why I'm saying this. But the biggest reason is that we don't actually know if red dwarfs can actually have similar habitable conditions to what we have around our star system. 
So these are still exciting planets, very exciting discoveries, but we don't really know what's going on on their surface. But the scientists in this paper went a little bit further and wanted to also see how many different star systems and potential exoplanets might also be able to detect our signals and of course planet Earth in the next 100 years or so. And it turns out that in a sphere of about 300 light years in diameter, there are approximately 1700 different stars that can actually see planet Earth. And statistically, if we assume that about a quarter of them would have some sort of a terrestrial planet, this means that there would be about 500 or so different planets able to see planet Earth and thus potentially identify life on our planet. But statistically speaking, of all of the stars that have received radio signals from planet Earth since the beginning of the radio age, the estimates suggest that there should be about 29 different habitable planets that might have received the signals and thus have a slight chance to maybe see and hear our planet. But once again, this is a really, really big if. Most of those stars are going to be red dwarfs, and the other stars might just have extremely different conditions on the surface. And at the same time, we have no idea if just having habitable conditions is enough to kickstart life either. So there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Nevertheless, at least statistically speaking, this is definitely a really interesting analysis and a pretty interesting discovery. But even though one day, using better telescopes, we might be able to even see the atmosphere of those planets, or even be able to detect potential signs of primitive life, the chance for us to discover an actual extraterrestrial intelligence is extremely, extremely low. And I will discuss more about this in some of the future videos on the so-called Fermi Paradox. The reason why we're not actually hearing a lot of extraterrestrial intelligence communicating with anyone. On that note, check out the relevant studies and the relevant links in the description below. Thank you for watching and subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.